Welcome to the Global Investor Podcast, a show that focuses on helping foreign investors enter the lucrative U.S. real estate market. Host Charles Carrillo combines decades of real estate investing experience with a professional background in international banking to interview experts in all areas of U.S. real estate investing. Now, here's your host, Charles Carrillo. Welcome to another episode of the Global Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Charles Carrillo. Today we have Spencer Hillegoss, and Spencer is a passive real estate investor, an active syndicator, and an executive leader for two real estate businesses. His own company, Masking Investing, has co-sponsored deals totaling more than 3,000 units for more than $328 million. He passively invests in multifamily and now also helps other investors get involved in multifamily syndications. Uh, He's a technology leader with 13-year track record of building high-performance teams across five companies, and three of which which are valued at at more than $1 billion. So thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, thanks so much, Charles. Really excited to be here and talk to you. Yeah, no, it's awesome. So I briefly uh, spoke about your professional experience. Can you expand a little bit more on your background prior to starting your, your current real estate business? Yeah, happy to. Um, So I'm actually based out here in the Bay Area. You know, the local business, uh, as we want to call it, that is technology. It's, you know, software companies often. Um, So that has been my background for the last 13 years. Um, You know, truth be told, I actually grew up in a real estate household as well. Uh, You know, my dad was a broker. So my earliest exposure was was, was probably six years old or something crazy like that. Um, But more recently, uh, starting in around uh, 2016, early 2016, um, the fifth of five companies that I've spent my time in, uh, in technology, building teams, leading organizations, uh, it was actually a real estate tech company. Um, and so that's how I found my way into this wonderful world from a real estate investing perspective, um, despite the fact that, you know, far back in the, in the day, I was, I was asked to do things like open houses for, you know, multi, multi-million dollar houses uh, but to support my dad's business, even as a teenager, he was making me do that kind of stuff. So it's not my first foray into real estate, but uh, we now are passively investing. Uh, and we are also, I have been doing that on the side um, for the past few years, as well as uh, building our own business um, actively. But I'm happy to report as recently as uh, this week, the cool update, even since we've booked the time together, um, you know, is, is that I put my, my time in, all right, I put my notice in for my, my tech career uh, to my employer this week. So, oh, so the nice. big update is, you know, finally pulling the ripcord or, you know, making the leap, whatever <laughs> metaphor that people want to use. Um, and so I'll be going full-time into just running our own business uh, so you, and investing. So you're building everything part-time up into this week? Correct. Yeah, wow. it, it, it's, it's been a labor of love. Um, <laughs> you know, it's not easy. Uh, but I, nights and weekends, um, you know, a lot of sacrifice, giving up hobbies that, you know, I used to love my Xbox. I used to be able to play a little bit more guitar. Um, besides being able to play wheels on the bus for my two young kids, I don't exactly play a lot of guitar beyond that these days. But it's, <laughs> it's basically been nights and weekends um, and then eking out time between meetings, uh, working at my day job. And of course, you know, to, to remind folks, like it, it is a real estate tech company where we, we target and work with real estate investors. So granted, you know, we can go more into that if, it, if we have time, Charles, but uh, that, that's been more focused on flippers and, and, and a different side of real estate than I currently focus on uh, in our own business. Is that one of the businesses that's valued over $1 billion that you were uh, putting teams together for? The flip? Well, yeah. Oh, great. Great question. Um, it actually is. Yeah. And, and so th- there's that just to go into that journey for a bit. Um, you know, I never in my life thought I would be in a sales leadership role, let alone a sales role within the tech world. I mean, I started off as a guy who was studying computer science back in high school. And so going into to college and then going out of college, um, I found myself just stumbling into, hey, let's go try a sales role. And then going through five different companies, three of which hit that billion dollar, you know, kind of buzzwordy, uh, kind of sexy sounding uh, unicorn label. Um, you end up just realizing certain things that you, you, you didn't realize that you would love in the first place. So. Um, Lending Home is <clears throat> is one of those companies. The prior two companies are not exactly the kind of thing that most people wake up in the morning and get excited, excited about. Um, I think it's exciting to work on unsexy problems, um, and but they're real problems. Like here's an example of, of the last two companies. Uh, one of them was uh, Gusto. You know, so Gusto, great company. I learned so much there. They're on a wonderful trajectory. 
um, that is definitely a unicorn. And it's, I, I don't know what the exact valuation is now, but it's far over a billion. So it's, um, you know, that was a payroll for small businesses company, payroll and HR. And so the, the, the other companies before that was, you know, accounting software uh, for small businesses. So these are the things yeah. most people don't wake up in the morning excited about. Uh, but the cool thing is you, you build that acumen, you build those skills over time and you make great connections with people in the small business world because real estate investors are very much small business owners um, as well, just like, just like all the rest. Yeah, the team building is definitely a, uh, a great asset to have uh, experience in when starting your own business and when also putting together a real estate team where there's so many people that are required just to whatever you're doing. If you're even if you're flipping properties, if you're buying and holding, um, whatever it might be, you need so many different people to facilitate a, a property. Um, now, you, your dad started off as a com your commercial broker. That's how you're in with your real estate business, which is very transactional. Why, how did you choose and why did you choose real estate investing as a part-time, at that point, um, investment or venture? Yeah, and, and if it's okay, Charles, I'd like to take you all the way back very briefly mm -hmm. to, to, to that dad experience. because So my dad, um, back in the 90s, he actually got to the point where he was actually he was in residential, um, but he was one of the top uh, residential brokers in the country. And so, you know, he was grinding tirelessly, uh, you know, to build that business. And it was through that experience of kind of watching him and him putting me to work, like as a teenager to go and work these open houses and glad hand, you know, very affluent buyers. Um, I, I, I didn't want to be there. Uh, of course, I wanted to go hang out with my friends and, and be able to have fun. But I, I was seeping those learnings on entrepreneurship from him and about work ethic from him. But the reason I bring that up, is because what guided me ultimately, if I look back, uh, what guided me to real estate investing, starting with passive investing, was this learning that I took away from that era of my life. And the learning is this, is that like we all have a choice on if we want to play financial defense and play, play financial offense. And as a person with you know, a family of my own, with two young kids, uh, a, a hardworking wife who's also my business partner, like I, I feel the obligation to play financial defense and offense as hard as I possibly can. And the reason I got those learnings was because my dad, shortly after building that business of his to a wonderful scale, and we had a comfortable lifestyle as a family growing up, we entered this period of time we call like the dark decade. Essentially, my, my younger brother, Justin, who was a, a, a early teen at the time, he was diagnosed, unfortunately, with pediatric cancer and he had a brief, beautiful life and he lost that battle. And as a result, um, what, what commonly happens in those cases is, you know, parents get divorced. Uh, it's, that's just common in those kinds of tragic situations. Um, but there's massive financial fallout, you know, you know, because of medical costs, because of damage to the business when you lose momentum. So all that stuff, all that pain and all that exposure to what happens when you don't necessarily have passive income to fall back on and when you're not working actively, those were the things that I was left with going out of college into the workforce was watching that kind of financial devastation and all that pain and realizing like, what are the answers to questions such as like, well, I got kids now, how do I avoid, you know, dealing with a debilitating injury if I get hurt? How do I deal with the fact of, uh, with major job loss? You know, like how do I protect my family against those kinds of things? And so that, those core principles and the reason I wanted to share that was because I, I looking back, have carried that learning with me and it fueled me. I didn't know it was going to be a passive investing in real estate strategy until I got to lending home until I got to lending home and stumbled my way in, my way in there. I was pointed towards it by a corp, one of my mentors in my corporate career. And I quickly found myself surrounded by these colleagues of mine that all had side hustles on the side, but they were flippers and I had no interest in becoming a flipper because a flipper is very much another active job. And I, wasn't looking for another active job. I was just looking for a way to build wealth. I was looking for a way to protect my family. And I was looking for a way to be uh, playing financial defense and playing financial offense as best I could. And I, I studied voraciously. You know, I read at least 24 books. I, I, I listened to 400 plus podcasts, as I'm sure that you have devoured as well. Um, and I, I did all that diligence. I even signed up for multiple coaching programs. And then I eventually found, like, just let's go take the leap. And we started investing in not multifamily at first. We, we actually started investing in rentals uh, where, where most people start. Very common narrative. We, we bought a duplex locally. 
because we weren't ready for site out of site purchase. We weren't ready for long distance purchase. We went, we went and got turnkey properties uh, out of state once we got comfortable with that. And the last stage, which I wish we had gone straight to right out the gates was we started investing passively in, in multifamily syndications. And that's our chosen passive strategies even now to this day. Um, and now we help other people get into those as well. So it's been a, it's been a wild journey, uh, but, but that, that's kind of the core principles behind uh, what brought me there. What was the biggest benefit in starting to invest in real estate passively? Was it, um, was it time? Was it the ability as uh, the financial freedom and having another source of income or multiple sources of income when you have multiple deals you're working on? Yeah, you, you know, this is fascinating. I don't think a lot of people necessarily make this connection, but, but for me, it resonates so much. And it was my experience. I wasn't originally planning when I first started doing this, I wasn't planning on, you know, eventually quitting my tech career to go full time. And I, I, what I had found as the key benefit right out the gates of doing a couple of these investments was you have a buffer, you know, and if you live in a pricey market, you know, well, we live in the Bay Area. If you live in other pricing markets, you know, maybe you live in New York, even other markets such as Boston and, and others are actually getting quite pricey as well at this stage of the cycle. Like that relief of knowing I have enough in passive income to at least cover my pricey Bay Area mortgage. It allows me to walk into the office and do even better work and be more focused with stronger perspective and less of that back of mind uh, fear of what happens if I lose this job. So over time, it became clear to me there's something more here. Like there's, if this isn't just about like going and having more confidence in my day job, this is like a real strategy that you can compound over time. And all you need to do is just keep doing it and keep doing it. And as your, your investments snowball, you know, I'm putting, you know, 50, 50,000 bucks into a, like a syndication, let's say like every, every, you know, few quarters or a couple quarters. And then it's going to come back to me in something like a five year period, hopefully, and hopefully it overperforms. And then I can go and roll it into others, you know? So it's stuff like that where I'm like, wait a sec, like I got momentum here and uh, it, maybe this could become something else. And how come no one else knows about this stuff? How come I didn't know about this stuff earlier? Cause the benefits are, are incredible. And also, man, I'm tired of getting taxed the way I've been taxed for the past 13 years. I give <laughs> half of my income to the federal government and I'm all about public services, but, but good Lord, I have paid so much in taxes and, and I see how many people are not paying in taxes by getting into real estate investment. And I'm like, I would like that. I would like that as well. <laughs> and which compounds that too, is you being in California. So you've got an extra tax on top of that. Not like what we have down here in Florida. So, but, um, it's great about the passive investing because, I mean, if you're, when people want to create passive income and they might start with smaller properties and I kind of uh, don't discourage it, but it's also, do you really want, do you want to learn the business and do more deals like actively or do you just want passive income and you're busy with your other job? And if it's B, then it's something where it's much better to work with a group and you're just getting money you know, quarterly, you're getting a quarterly distribution to your account and you're getting a monthly report and maybe there's a quarterly, you know, webinar or something, but it's, I mean, it's totally hands off. It's, and there's no, you know, there's not, no one's calling you saying, Hey, we need more money for the roof. We need more money here. Cause that was all taken care of initially. You know what I mean? That was all completely. Raised. Yeah. And if I could make a quick comment on that one, Charles, I, I feel like there was this formative moment for, for Jennifer and I, when we had invested locally. So we owned a duplex. We had a property manager on it. We also have uh, a modest portfolio of turnkey properties that we bought in the Midwest. And I'm, I'm happy to report they are cash flowing. You know, they're, they're doing well. It's like 250 bucks a door. And we, and we we're, we're happy with the performance. But even with that said, like we still have the occasional property manager call. And, and frankly, it, it is not infrequent. Um, so the headache was still there. So we, we looked at that strategy right before we got to investing passively in multifamily syndications. And we asked ourselves like, wait a second, we go down this road. Let's say that we magically could wave a wand and suddenly have a hundred properties all generating 250 bucks in cash flow per month. Well, that income sounds great, but, but just run, you know, run the numbers and say, how many phone calls are we still going to be having to deal with? Assuming that we're, you know, we're, we're dealing with hopefully a limited number of property managers. We still had to manage the manager. And, and, and that is something that people don't often talk about in, in the turnkey discussions is that I do think turnkey 
for example, is a fine strategy. I really do. I think that for people who can't quite make that mental leap and into multifamily and real estate syndications, because it's just, you know, for all the reasons that they typically get scared of it, because bigger is a little scarier for people right up out the gates. I really encourage folks to at least just ask themselves what level of time commitment they want to put mm -hmm. into it. You know, like I, I have my, my brother-in-law, for example, is a pediat uh, pediatric oncologist. Like he, he is extraordinarily busy. He does not have time to even breathe on some days. Many, he has multiple kids, many responsibilities. He doesn't want to have to pick up the phone and deal with that, which is why things like investing in real estate syndications, just like we do, is a great strategy match for him because he doesn't want to take the time to do that phone call for sure. Yeah, the hassle you'll have if you're putting $50,000 in, let's, which is traditionally the minimum for anybody listening into a syndication, investing that in. And even if you are buying, maybe you buy a condo cash $100,000 or a house cash for $100,000 in the Midwest and you're renting it. Um, when it gets down to that, like you said, $250, $300 a month is actually what you're netting. And it only takes one tenant, one eviction, one roof mishap, one, you know, one issue with the HVAC system to wipe out a year plus of your gains. And yes. then also you're the one that's now, if it's not local, you're the one now having to call someone, you know, tell your property manager, Hey, get someone over there. What happened? Did it get fixed? Did it not? So it's, it's, you know, and the turnkey is a great way of doing it. It's great for someone that wants to start actively investing. Um, but also the other benefits, I mean, people, the other issues, I guess you would say with turnkey, not, uh, I guess, drawbacks, let's say, is that the value has already been created when they buy it, when you buy that property. So they, they've already done the flip. They've already found, you know, they've, they've done a lot of work for you and they can hand it over to you, but you're not going to see a huge appreciation right off the bat. Like you would, if you flipped the place and you rented it out afterwards. So it's, it's still a good strategy. It's great for someone that's starting and then they figure out exactly who do they need for their team, what issues I had and how to avoid it for the next one, which is usually just by going larger. You know what I mean? But, um, right. So what you made the switch from passive investing, larger properties, I imagine, what, what kind of properties were you passively invested into um, initially when you started? Yeah, you know, so once we, we graduated ourselves out of the, uh, the residential properties and we, we had done the turnkey experience, we were looking for something more passive. We went into multifamily apartments um, and, and we did that by, uh, I, you know, networking like crazy. I was going to meetups. I was on biggerpockets.com, which I strongly encourage people to get on and just, just dig into those forums as much as you possibly can. Cause that's what I did. I found that invaluable because there's so many people out there that are willing to answer those questions and help guide you. You got to always, of course, have a discerning eye. You know, this is the real world. You might interact with a person who seems like they're going to be very authentic with you and maybe you, that won't be the case. But I would, I have found the vast majority of real estate investors in this community and the established ones are great people and, and they, they care about giving um, and the, yes, they're, they're there to run a business, but they're not there to, to, to take your money and screw out your money. Um, so I went on those, those, those forums and I just started lo looking at and like trying to understand the perspectives and the track records of the people that were doing this and saying that they were looking for investors. So that, that's where I started around that time. I was also looking for a coach. You know, I, I believe wholeheartedly in coaching. I have done it in my corporate career, you know, hundreds of hours, hundreds and hundreds of hours. But I just believe that, that, that it's something that works well in this world to help people get better at, at, skill, at skill development and at knowledge. So I, I was hiring a coach and I interviewed about seven uh, or eight, maybe eight uh, co coaches, like real estate coaches that were also established multifamily syndicators. And I, and I was not necessarily going down the active path at that point. I was still trying to figure out, like, who could I invest with? And so when I, once I did that, I had, uh, you know, killed two birds with one stone, basically. I had made this connection with, with these great, uh, you know, brilliant, successful people that I would like to maintain a relationship with, regardless of whatever direction we go on the active side once, once we got there. But on the passive side, I, I could sit there and compare. I could say, like, well, my communication style seems to jive really well with this individual. So that, that was how I found them. And, you know, we started looking into markets such as Texas uh, and a couple of, like Alabama, um, you know, a, a couple of places that were not California um, mm -hmm. because the, the, the big mental leap <clears throat> that I think most of my brethren out here in the Bay Area, particularly in the tech community, um, which is ironic to me, uh, they really struggled with the notion of doing sight unseen investment. 
And I did too. That's why we bought a local duplex and paid way too much for it for 250 bucks in cash flow per month, which we could have just as easily done um, in other ways in other markets. So that, that, that was kind of the journey that, that um, we, we found and followed uh, to go get to our first kind of uh, passive investments in mobile family. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about is that what was, what was some of the mistakes you made initially when you were actively investing and you, uh, with the smaller properties, what are some of the mistakes you made and what are the things you didn't expect to happen that ended up uh, happening? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would have to come back to that duplex example, but I got to take it a layer deeper because it really illustrates why it's important to understand your strategy. Uh, so many folks just jump into action and that's very much what we did, you know, as opposed to going and sitting down and like, talking to, if you have a partner or hopefully have a sounding board or like a mentor of some sort, ask yourself, why are we doing with this? Why are we going to go invest in this thing in real estate in general? And for us, we have a number that we're, we're targeting. We have a passive income target of monthly income that we are wanting to hit. And, but we didn't have that number established yet when we went and bought a duplex and that duplex cost $430,000 which is not exactly a bargain. And so, you know, I'm, I'm happy to report like, yes, there's a loan on it, of course, but also it is appreciating. So that's the first bad, you know, big bad learning. But I, I look back and I don't regret it because it got us on base. As, you, as people say, it was our first investment and it made us feel confident that we can go and take on the next challenge. But the learning there was we didn't realize our chosen strategy was focused exclusively on cash flow, Like, a property that's going to appreciate, maybe that 430 goes up to 600, 700 over the many years and we eventually sell it. That doesn't necessarily help us on our journey to go and build, you know, up to a, you know, maybe $10,000 a month in cash flow. Uh, we could have made that, that, that money on the end of that down payment go way further in generating thousands of dollars in monthly cash flow towards our target if we had just looked at that and set that goal first. And that's why goal setting is so critical. It's so tempting for people to say, oh, emotion, drive me. Uh, take me to that first purchase. Let me go. I have capital. It's burning a hole in my pocket. Let me go put that into a property. But in reality, it's the most important thing to slow down and, and take the time. And we, we, my wife and I took two whole weekends up front after we had that realization. And we just did long-term planning. And there was some serious debate. And, and we got so much closer as a result of that, those discussions. But that was the big first mistake I would say is just not being clear on what we wanted out of it and setting a strategy. Yeah. It's really uh, having that goal of what you want. And sometimes people have an ultimate number, but really to get them started or get them, uh, you know, get them out of their job or something like this, the number is much lower than they kind of set as their ultimate, say 10 or 15 year goal. And it's also focusing on it too, where the appreciation is great, but it's also, it's not going to, if your goal is $120,000 a year, uh, that's not going to help with, um, I mean, it's great to have that money and hopefully it appreciates and stuff like this, but it's not helping your passive income at all. You know what I mean? Your passive Absolutely. income is still at 500 bucks or 200 bucks a month. You know what I mean? Completely. So, what, what markets are you focused on? You said Texas. What other markets are you guys focused on now? You're really bullish on. Yeah, you know, and I think at this stage of the cycle, um, and for your listeners, I assume, you know, you have a pretty savvy audience, but I'll just, you know, say when I say the real estate cycle or the economic cycle, we've had a very strong growth for the past decade, basically. And, and, and that means you have to be more discerning. You know, you can't just run out there and find a great deal. And there's more people than ever right now out there competing for these deals. So um, we focus on Texas still. And the reason I want to focus on that, and we'll, I'll give you other you know, market references of where we have focus. So Alabama, uh, Florida, so you know, uh, a state you know quite well, um, and, and the Carolinas. So we've been more focused on those recently. So Texas, Alabama, the Carolinas, and Florida. Um, and we, we strike up partnerships with folks in those, in those states, both from a passive uh, investing perspective as well as our active work now. But the comment I wanted to make on the stage of the cycle we're at and how important it is to be more discerning is that I used to think when I first got into this, this business, that when people said the market is good or the market is bad or the market's overheated or the market's past peak, I thought that that meant like the, you can just throw blanket categorizations out there like that. So, so take Dallas Fort Worth as an example. That is a huge geographical footprint. 
And I didn't, you know, as a, as a kind of a dummy Californian who wasn't initiated on this many years ago, having gone out there many times now and driven around that huge metro area that is Dallas, I, I, I can fully appreciate this learning that you have to look more closely. You know, you have, you have to look down to the submarket. And so, you know, there, there's a couple submarkets, for example, even on a deal that, that we just worked on, where it is this wonderful apartment building that one of our partners found. And we're working, we worked on this deal with them. It is surrounded with growing employers that continue and have declared their, their continued investment in that area. And the workforce housing, you know, the, the, in that apartment that, that we're going to focus on is the same match for that employer base, for that employee base. So you have these, these fundamentals that you can actually dig into and find publicly available data, you know, to go in and analyze these things. So I just wanted to call that out because there are certainly overheated markets, submarkets and neighborhoods within Dallas for sure. Um, but you can't just, you know, condemn the entire area or, or praise an entire area. You've got to take it a layer deeper. So those are some of the markets and how, kind of how we, how I think about them. Yeah, the sub market is very important in how you mentioned the, the neighborhood because that was something I was going to mention. Really, when you're buying, you're actively investing. Um, you want to really drive and know those areas. And the brokers that you're dealing with, the commercial brokers you're dealing with will appreciate that and know that you're a lot, a lot more serious because you actually say, well, you know, this is the street. You know, these are the streets I want. These are the ones I don't. Um, we purchased a 59 unit um, in North Tampa three months ago or so. and um, People are like, oh, that's a the area is not the best. But the thing is that where we were was in the path of, uh, path of gentrification, and they're putting in, they're renovating a mall with a quarter billion dollars. Mall's, nice. all, mall's already vacant, and it's pretty much a butts on that property. So it's something where you are, you have to get a little bit more creative in this mark in this part of the market. I think in this uh, where we are now in the market cycle, as you mentioned, to find properties. It's not like where maybe four years ago, five years ago you kind of just like, you know, throw a dart and you're like, let's, you know, this is a good town, right? And I'm, I'm going to make money one way or another in this. It's now it has to be, um, you have to have your criteria really mapped out and you have to know exactly for the neighborhoods exactly. And that's really just knowing what you're investing into and knowing, uh, even if you're, if you're not local, uh, going to, you know, if you're not local, and you're not able to go to the town hall, reading everything that's on that property, reading what new development's going on, reading, you know, where people are coming into, what ages they are that are moving into your area and stuff like that. So it's extremely important. Yeah. Well, congratulations on that acquisition. That sounds great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's awesome. Um, are you guys focused on the all multifamily or have you ever invested passively or actively in any other asset classes within real estate, like self-storage or mobile home parks? Is, does that interest you at all or you're? Yeah, actually, um, very much so. And so we, uh, we've done uh, a couple um, self storage investments. Uh, I love that asset class. Um, I I really am fascinated with mobile home parks, and I have reviewed actually dozens of deals in mobile home parks um, in manufactured housing communities. You know, I, I think that is an asset class I want to go and study up on more. You know, one of the things that matters a lot to me is that before I pull the trigger on an investment, or if we're going to go actively partner on one of these projects with. Um, you know, with someone based in another, another geo and, and we're going to, we're going to do like self storage. I studied up a lot on really understanding, like, how do you analyze that differently than multifamily? Because I do not feel comfortable going in and helping other people get involved in a syndication, for example, uh, as part of the LP team, uh, the limited partner team. I don't, I don't feel comfortable of having them jump in alongside us unless I can really understand that and speak to everything in great detail. And so, you know, once I got to that point, I, I was really sold on self-storage. I think self-storage is great. I think it has tons of runway. Um, you still have to be with all those disclaimers that, of course, we've already talked about. Uh, be discerning. You know, make sure you have a, a great operator. Make sure you have a great GP team on, on whatever project you might be investing in. Um, but man, oh man, I would love to get more involved in mobile home parks just because I've seen the financials. And I've also just talked to some of the best operators, what people consider the best operators in the country on these, on these mobile home park projects that, that are more well known. And I look at that and I'm like, man, that is so wonderfully unsexy and extraordinarily profitable. So <laughs> I would, uh, you know, long winded answer, but self storage, great. I'm already doing some, not as much okay. as multifamily. Mobile home parks would love to learn more and get more involved on that front. 
Yeah, I was at a couple of conferences and one I was at a couple of weeks ago, someone was telling me that there's only been one mobile home park, I think, built in the last year, which is crazy. Wow. And, um, and then I was at a self-storage conference and they were saying that there was like 18 being built around DFW, Dallas, Fort Worth area that were like in construction over the, <laughs> but that's, I mean, the self-storage can, if the population's coming in, the self-storage definitely will just fall right behind it, especially with renters. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, there's some parity there, right? You have yeah. the parity between like, they got to put their stuff somewhere. So, <laughs> yeah, I had an expert on before uh, that was a couple of shows back, David Thompson. And he was saying that I think it was seven or eight square feet per person in with whatever it is. So many miles of it is uh, is where they figure out if the demand, uh, if there's more demand than there is. And it can actually uh, if, if a new building, a new uh, complex can actually uh, be rented out and be created there, which is very interesting and in how they have that they done so well and have it focused. But, um, well, Spencer, well, thank you very much for being on the show. Um, how can listeners learn more about you and your business and uh, see what you got going on? Yeah. Uh, and thanks so much for having me, Charles. It's been a blast. Um, so they, folks can reach out to me directly if they like, and I encourage them to, um, Spencer at Madison investing.com. Um, that's my email address, or they can go to our website where we've got a lot of great info as well and some educational resources and a mailing list. And so if folks want to just jump in and start learning, this is a no obligation thing. Anyone can join. Um, they can go and just and join our mailing list at madisoninvesting.com. Okay. Well, that sounds great. I really appreciate you being on the show today. I'll put all those links and contact information in the notes section so you can easily find those. And um, yeah, let's uh, look forward to uh, catching up with you in the future and uh, have a great rest of your day. Yeah, you too. Thanks so much for having me on, Charles. It's been a blast. Thanks a lot. Hi guys, this is Charles from the Global Investors Podcast. I hope you enjoyed the show. If you're interested in investing in real estate and you don't know where to begin, set up a free 15-minute strategy call with me at schedulecharles.com. That's schedulecharles.com. Thank you for listening to the Global Investor Podcast. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or Google Play to get new weekly episodes. For more resources and to receive our newsletter, please visit globalinvestorpodcast.com. And don't forget to join us next week for another episode. Nothing in this episode should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Any investment opportunities mentioned on this podcast are limited to accredited investors. Any investments will only be made with proper disclosure, subscription documentation, and are subject to all applicable laws. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Harborside Partners Incorporated exclusively.